All right, so first things first, welcome to the show, Doctor. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, great to be with you, Trevor. Trevor. Well, thank you for being there, and then thank you for talking to me here, I should say. I feel like we have to change our language for the world we live in now. Um, you are one of the few people who has a unique insight into what is happening now. As somebody who served as the U.S. Uh, Surgeon General, you had a very specific job, and that is essentially keeping the nation healthy. And you've commented on how unfair it is to send doctors in to fight the coronavirus when the government is not giving them the equipment that they need to protect themselves. What do you think people are missing about the fight doctors are having with this virus? Well, Trevor, this feels very personal to me. You know, it, it is my friends, my family members and colleagues who are on the front lines now of the war that we're waging uh, with this new virus and a very dangerous virus. And we're asking them in many cases to go into battle without the armor they need. There are doctors who are having to reuse masks because their hospitals are running out, even though they know that puts them at greater risk. There are doctors who are running out of gowns and gloves. There are hospitals that are running out of ventilators, and they're trying to figure out how to use one ventilator and share them between two patients at the same time. So it is not wrong to ask doctors and nurses to work hard. It's not bad wrong to ask them to sacrifice to take care of their patients. But I believe it's wrong to send them in without the protection that they deserve. And that's why, as a country, we need to be pulling out the stops on ramping up production of all of the materials that they need. It's not enough to say, we'll do it when we need it. It's not enough to say, well, it's up to somebody else to solve that problem. Like at all, every level of government, we need to be making this a top priority because doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers are putting their lives on the line for us, and it's high time that we had their protection. A growing consensus uh, that's starting to emerge both online and unfortunately in the White House is this idea that the cure, which is social distancing, et cetera, as some people are, are calling it, is going to be worse than what is being caused by people being unemployed, et cetera. What do you think people are missing when they say, we're just gonna have to live with this, allow people to get sick and accept that some people are going to die? Well, I think it's look, important to consider the, the pros and cons of every approach. And let's be honest, there is no perfect approach here, uh, but it is, I think, a false choice to say that we have to choose between people's lives and the economy, because the real way uh, that we should be addressing this virus is to recognize that the way we save the economy is actually by defeating the virus. Unless we take these steps and make sure that these are in place, uh, we really should not be thinking about pulling back. That is a recipe for making the, situ the situation, both the health and the economic situation, much, much worse. Before I let you go, um, you have a book that is coming out that speaks to a situation that we all find ourselves in right now, and that is we're isolated from people that we know and love, Many people are forced to stay at home either by themselves or not with the community they're used to. You write in your book about how society is struggling with a new disease and that is essentially loneliness. What are some of the things people can do to try and maintain their mental health as well as their physical health? I'm so glad you asked, Trevor, because it's important not just because loneliness makes us feel poorly, but also because we now understand that chronic loneliness is actually bad for our health. It increases our risk for heart disease, it shortens our, uh, it's associated with a shorter lifespan. But there are things that we can do to ensure that we strengthen social connection. And as hard as this time is, I think that we can potentially come out of it even stronger if we do a few things. So number one, I think it's important that we spend at least 15 minutes a day, if not more, engaged with the people that we love, whether that means video conferencing with them, writing to them, calling them on the phone so we can hear their voice. The second is it's really important that we make that time count. And that means improving the quality of our time with others by decreasing the distractions that we experience during our interactions. So instead of talking to somebody on the phone while you're also scrolling through your social media feed and refreshing your inbox and watching the news on TV, just try talking to them with your full attention. One of the greatest gifts that we can give people is the gift of our full attention. And finally, it's important also to recognize that one of the back doors out of loneliness, if you will, one of the great but hidden solutions to loneliness is service. It's by helping others uh, that we actually take the focus off of ourselves and place it on someone else. It's how we rebuild a connection to someone or establish a new one. And it's also how we remind ourselves 
that we have value to give to the world. Mm -hmm. Because one of the great prices that we pay when we're lonely is over time we start to buy into the idea that maybe we're lonely because we're not likable. Maybe in some way it's our fault. Maybe this is evidence of some personality flaw. And none of that is true. But when we serve other people, we're reminded of how good it feels to connect and that we have something of great value uh, to bring to them and to others around them. Oh, Doc, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the words. Uh, hopefully people will listen and we'll be seeing you on the other side. Have a good one. Thanks so much, Trevor. Take care and stay safe.